Greg and Ron, Sir Donald, uh, did he have any influence over you in your playing careers? Well, obviously, yes, he was a selector. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Trevor. And neither of us would have played had he not selected us. And <laughs> I sort of have the feeling that what he said went. Uh, so although the other selectors had a say, um, I'm assuming that he had the major say. So, yes, he had a hell of a lot of influence. And Greg, for you? Yes, he was also a selector for South Australia <laughs> at the time that I, I started. So, uh, <clears throat> obviously, saw a lot of him around the, uh, the dressing room and around the, uh, around the Adelaide Oval um, around that time. I was fortunate enough to uh, be in the right place at the, at the right time one day in the dressing room when Sir Donald had been in for his morning cup of tea and on his way out, I said good morning to him and he stopped. And I happened to be holding a cricket bat at the time and he, uh, he looked at at me holding the bat and he said I'd change that grip if I were you and I said well that's interesting but what would you suggest and he said well the grip I use worked pretty well um, <laughs> and I said what was that and uh, he showed me what the what the grip was and um, he turned to, to leave and he, he stopped and turned back and said and by the way he said I've given this advice to one other player he didn't take it and he's no longer in the team <laughs> so I changed my grip that day and uh, <laughs> With great effect. It was a, a wonderful piece of advice. <laughs> and, and Alex, for you, did the, um, the Bradman legend, was that um, something you were aware, aware of as a child growing up? Yeah, definitely. Um, I received a, a birthday present from my father, which was a, a Don Bradman um, biography, and uh, I got a little way through that. Um, I, I don't often get right to the end of books, especially when I was uh, little, but... Um, uh, he, he's someone that, um, you know, when you think of cricket, you, you think of Don Bradman and even as a, as a youngster I was, um, you know, in awe of his ability and uh, for me personally I was uh, awarded uh, the Bradman Scholarship in my first year of university. So that's probably the biggest impact um, Don Bradman has had on, on me in that I was awarded a very important scholarship that assisted me, um, you know, at a crucial time in my cricket career and, um, you know, something that was in honour of him. Mm. And, Mike, for you, what was the one lasting memory of Sir Donald? I suppose the, the thing that was the sort of as, as mythical as, as anything about Don Bradman in, in, in England was, um, was that last innings at the Oval and, and all this um, tears pouring down people's faces and... Um, he has to walk through a, an alley of, uh, of, of fielders who clapped him to the crease. And then he misses a straight ball <laughs> and gets bowled for naught. Um, I, I mean, I think that was a story that sort of got told and told. Mm. So when I was a little lad, that, that would be the, probably the first thing I heard about him. I mean, you heard that he was this great player. And if he hadn't, aver he hadn't got out for naught, he'd have averaged 100. And well, if I hadn't got out for naught, I'd have averaged 23. <laughs> Mike, you, you spoke about uh, the sport and obviously cricket in, in, uh, in particular, bringing out the best in people, whether it be an opponent or, or a test. And I, um, I, I'd say to all of you, again, a, a question, whether it is an opponent or, a, or a, a, a particular test in a cricket match, what was it that brought out the best in you? Alex, I'll ask you ladies first. Oh, OK. Um, yeah, look, I, I, I took a lot from, from that, Mike, and... Um, yeah, the fact that opponents are, are co-creators of you as a, as a cricketer and um, even just recently uh, playing for New South Wales country against New South Wales City. Um, country hadn't won for, for years and years and uh, the City girls were letting us know that um, when we were out there. And um, I captain New South Wales, so all of the people on the field, I'm their captain in, on any other day, but, you know, the City girls, uh, they weren't so much treating me as their captain that day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, um, I'm facing up to Sarah Ailey, who is one of our better bowlers, and, and you just know how much she wants to get you out. And um, the fielders were supporting that sort of notion as well. So um, that, that, that particular moment recently certainly brought out the best of me because I thought, yeah, hang on a sec, I'm your captain and you're, you're doing this. But, um, you know, they... 
they were really playing the game. Um, they were properly competing, as, as Mike was saying. And, and that brought out the best in me and, and I was able to actually hit a, hit a winning innings in that environment and, and that gave me so much satisfaction. Mm. Rod? Oh, I mean, I think the most important thing about uh, playing the game is the team aspect. Uh, I think to be able to divorce yourself and your performances, uh, although you desperately want to do well and you know if you don't do well that you mightn't be there next week, but to be able to divorce yourself from that and to put the team first, I think is probably the most important thing uh, about the game. Because, uh, for a variety of reasons, but uh, one of the main things being that, that it is a team and you are playing against, I mean, it's a war. It's a, it, you're, you're fighting against another team and your aim as a unit is to beat the other unit. And if you do that, there is, to me, uh, no greater feeling, particularly if it's against Brearley's mob, you know? <laughs> Greg? Well, you've got to understand that I grew up with an older brother and, you know, we played test matches in the backyard and, and they were pretty serious stuff. What Michael doesn't understand is that my first test matches were for England because Ian, as the older brother, was Australia and <laughs> I, had to be, uh, I had to be England, so that was a hell of a challenge. And, <laughs> learning to compete. I learned to compete in the backyard uh, within those, those test matches. So that translated very easily into, into real games of cricket later on. And I've got to say, some of the, uh, you know, apart from Ashes test matches, which were always very competitive, some of the, the greatest contests that I had on the cricket field were as a, as a Queenslander playing against Western Australia because Rod and Dennis were two of my closest mates when we played. And those matches were very, very serious. Um, it was about the bra bragging rights and uh, it was about not giving in to these buggers because I knew what I'd cop at the end of the day if, if they came out on top. Which you they ever didn't beat do, us or not? Which they didn't do very often oh, despite... Yeah. See, they talk about this... What's, what's that game you talk about? The, buddy, uh, the game of the century was the one time they beat Queensland and they remember it. <laughs> Worst thing that ever happened to Australian cricket was Queensland winning the Sheffield Shield. That's the way I look at things. <laughs> Mike, you covered so many topics, but for you, was there one opponent or one particular test that brought out the best in you from the, from the game? I, I don't really know. Though, I, I mean, I, I keep thinking of different things. One was the, what, what Greg was talking about, the rivalry of county cricket was like that too. The Middlesex playing against Surrey or against Yorkshire, and you, you had a proper battle, and, and, uh, and, and some of those matches were really hard fought. We played a match against Surrey who had Sylvester Clark, who wasn't the slowest bowler, and it was on a relayed pitch, which, which was up and down. And we had Wayne Daniel and um, Vincent van der Baal, so we were at least their equivalent. But that was a great game of cricket, you know. Unfortunately, it rained, and they didn't want to come and play, but <laughs> we wanted to. <laughs> I, I think it, it so it was about the garden, and, and I used to, when I was about five, I used to dig for Australia, you know? Yeah. To Australia. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Not for it, to it. See that one coming up. Oh, you've all been a, a captain of either your state or, or country. And, and Mike, you, if I recall correctly, you said, uh, I think it was respect was the one key thing that you, were, you used to be able to get, out the, to get the most out of, um, or Ian Botham at the time. But um, what is it for the other three of you that uh, is one key thing you have employed that has got the best out of players under you? Uh, look, uh, I think one of the most challenging times for me as a captain was leading in a World Cup final when we only had 106 runs on the board. And this is for a T20, 50 over games, that would have been even worse. But, um, you know, 106 runs um, against a team, New Zealand, who had beaten us eight times consecutively um, prior to that match. And, you know, that was a tough time. And I think the number one thing going out onto the field was just to, to never give up, and that's the, the Australian way, and um, also to enjoy the occasion. Like n not often do you get to play a, a final, and if, if we went out there and, and just played to the very last ball and, and enjoyed the process along the way, um, you know, that, that was going to do it for us, and yeah, we, we won off the last ball, so um, the girls followed my instruction. And, but yeah, um, it's just about focusing on why you're doing um, what you're doing. And for me, it's, it comes down to the basics of 
what it feels like to hit the middle of the bat and the ball go flying and, and the sound it makes and, and the feeling and um, it, that, that battle between success and failure, you, you can try and sort of nullify that a little bit by just going back down to why you're doing it, the, the joy you get from, from the skill aspect and um, that's what I try and do personally. Well, we only had 77 to defend against Queensland and we beat them easily. So, you know, I, mean, I don't know what this problem is with 105 against New Zealand. My God. Jeez. Well, I think one occasion I can remember was a, a test match in which Michael played. It was in Perth and Dennis Lilly went out to bat with an aluminium bat. Um, Dennis turned up in the nets in the morning with this aluminium bat and... I was in a difficult position because we were only batting on to annoy these blokes. Um, so I knew we weren't going to bat for we long. <laughs> we didn't need any more than that. <laughs> anyway, uh, so Dennis came out of the nets with his aluminium bat and I thought, I've got a problem here because if I tell him he can't use it, then I'm his captain and I've got to then try and get him to bowl well for us later on. So I thought, look, he's at the non-striker's end. We'd come off for bad light or rain the night before. There's only a few balls to go. I'll let him use it, and then the end of the first over would change it, you see. Well, Rodney Hogg was our 12th man, and I gave Hoggy instructions to take the willow bat out at the end of this two or three ball uh, hiatus, you see. And Hoggy, being a fast bowler, didn't have a lot of courage. Um, and I, <laughs> I got... I, I sort of went about my own business and forgot to supervise him, and I sort of realised that something was wrong. I looked around, and Hoggy was still in the dressing room. And I said to him, Hoggy, long, something along the lines, Hoggy what the bloody hell are you doing? You know, he, he said, look, I couldn't go out there. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, all I could see was me being hit over the head with the aluminium bat <laughs> in front of all these people and millions of people on television. Anyway, about this time, Michael started complaining to the umpires about the damage to their new ball, you see. So the umpires insisted the bat was changed and it was subsequently changed amid a bit of hullabaloo as Dennis helicoptered it across the ground. But... Half an hour later, we were in the field and I walked up to Dennis with the new ball at the top of his mark and I said, look, can you see that bloke down there, Michael, with the bat? He was the prick that complained about the <laughs> aluminium bat. So there was no trouble getting him motivated for that day. Uh, Rod, a question for you. Mike brought up the point, uh, how much room is there for individual expression? Are we belting the bejesus out of uh, the characters of the game? Well, I mean, what is a character in cricket? Uh, that's, that's the question. I mean, does a character have to say anything? I, I mean, personally, I don't think so. I think what a character has to do is to do something. And, uh, I mean, if you have a look at MS Dhoni, for example, um, I mean, I saw some of his innings the other night when he played some extraordinary shots against us. And, I mean... I don't think I've ever seen a calmer man behind the stumps. I don't, I, in fact, I can't understand how you can be that calm <laughs> when you're watching your bowlers bowl that much crap. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's amazing. He is amazing the way he remains calm. But to me, he, he, he's a great character. He's a great character. And, I mean, we saw Faulkner the other night. He, I mean, he's a kid from Tasmania, from Launceston. I mean... He's got the characteristics of a character. And, I mean, I think there are characters out there. I mean, but you don't have to say anything to be a character. You don't have to do much at all except play good cricket, I reckon. Greg, you wouldn't have had to worry about this. Social media and Twitter and Facebook when you were a skipper. Um, well, there's so many distractions now for, or, you know, things that uh, attract the attention of, uh, of young sports people coming up. Um, other sports as well. The next generation of, of stars in cricket, um, it doesn't seem to be growing as much in cricket, especially with the bat perhaps, or even spin bowlers. Are, are we doing enough to develop them? Yeah, look, I think we are. Um, it's challenging. Life's challenging. Um, you know, being, a, being excellent at something is, is, is a real challenge. And I think all, all that we as an organisation, Cricket Australia, can do is provide the opportunities for the, for the next generation and that includes some education around all of those things. Um, you know, social media is a big part of, of their life. I can remember as head coach at the Centre of Excellence a couple of years ago sitting in my office, opposite which there was an IT room for the, for the guys to 
keep up with, you know, looking at their videos or whatever, but also they're doing their emails and so on. And I, I remember looking up one day and there were six of them sitting in this room uh, and they were all on computers and, and whatnot. I just wandered in and to have a bit of a, a, bit of a chat and you know, said, why don't you guys, or, or, what are you doing? And they were all on Facebook communicating with each other via the, the computer. I said, why don't you turn the bloody things off and just sit down and have a chat? But the thing was they were including a lot of other people um, obviously on their, on their Facebook page. It's a, it's a, very, it's a very different world. Um, you know, I think it's all rele relevant to what's going on in, in their life as it was with ours. I must admit I'm grateful we didn't have mobile phones and all that sort of stuff to, to deal with. But I think all we can do is sort of, you know, set the parameters and give them some education. And those that are good enough will, uh, you know, will navigate their way through it and, and be good cricketers as well. Mike, uh, it's, is it cyclic, but do you guys seem to be doing a good job, obviously, winning the Ashes, both uh, the men and the women. Um, can you share any secrets that England's doing to, uh, to entice a young generation of stars? We learned from Australia, <laughs> probably, in, in setting up a, a centre of excellence and probably, what, about seven or eight years ago when Rod came over and worked there and um, did some good things for us. Um, and, uh, and the other thing to say about that is that things go round. And the West Indies were the best team for 15 years and Australia were the best team for, what, 12 years? I don't know how many years, something like that. And, and now that neither of those teams is the best team, at the, just at the moment anyway. It might change, but... <coughs> So, I don't know. I mean, one of the biggest changes, to go back to the topic we had just now, is the number of people around the dressing room. I mean, apart from players. Uh, when we came to Australia, we had a manager, a physio, a scorer, and, and maybe we had an assistant manager, maybe we didn't. And the manager, we used to think, was largely occupied in, in drinking with the board of the Australian Cricket Board, <laughs> and making sure the gin and tonics were all right. But, I mean, that was a nasty view, but anyway, that was a bit of a view. And... and, uh, and we didn't have a coach, or if we did, it was the assistant manager who might do a little bit of coaching, and and then one would sometimes be worried he was trying to get someone to change at the beginning of a cricket tour to Australia when, you know, if he was going to do that sort of a change, he should be doing it some other time. So I think the difficulty of having all these people around the dressing room, all of whom have got to do something or be seen to do something, and for a captain and the, and the overall coach to manage that lot as well as the team, seems to me a great difficulty. And one of the things that I do wonder about, I think cricket's much the same as it was in, all, in the main central ways. And still bowl with the You back this like that, but other than that, things are very similar, you know? But I think that um, the, the, the emphasis on computer information could turn people from a certain sort of spontaneity and a certain sort of themselves into something that becomes uh, cut off and rather uh, external. You know, you see this thing about your your play, and you and, and you and you, you know, I heard of a I heard a story about a young English bowler in a 50 over match who had no idea whatever about the tactical state of the game when they were fielding. He was only worried about whether the right wrist was just exactly that angle or this angle. You know, so there could be a sort of arrow. So I wonder about all that. But I think basically the game's in, in pretty good health and, uh, and, and so many things have got much better. Mm. And the fielding, the, the, the running between the wickets and the inventiveness of the batting, <coughs> the, the aggressive approach of the batting on the holes compared with what it was in my day. And, I mean, the other opening batsman, of course, in my day was uh, Jeffrey. And, and he wasn't too pleased with me for complaining about <laughs> the aluminium bat. I shouldn't wonder. <laughs> One thing that's uh, certainly improved, the, the m most recent media rights deal was the most lucrative, of course, for Australian cricket. Um, David Barham, you can thank him for one of those. Uh, it's certainly earlier in the year we had um, Cricket Australia leading the way with the females in the increasing the pay from uh, the minimum was from 15,000 to 50, oh, sorry, for the top tier was 15,000 to 52,000 and the minimum payment was from five to 25. Um, just in comparison, though, the comparison with the men's minimum payment is 235. So with this, Alex, uh, with this new deal, and uh, James is in the room, and Dean Kino, and Wally, of course, and, and uh, Ben and Mafia, but would, do you expect a, a pay rise sometime uh, soon again to be able to, uh, to continue to improve? <laughs> Um, look, well, firstly, if it we... It wasn't a leading question. Recognize, it was a bouncer. Yeah. Um, 
recognising um, the pay increase. I mean, no one's going to knock back that sort of mm. level of um, pay rise, are they? And it doesn't really happen um, in everyday sort of work. But, um, yeah, I think it, it's recognising uh, from Cricket Australia, they're, they're, they're recognising, um, you know, what we're giving up to play the game and, and the sacrifices that we do make and, and also the success we're having already. So... Uh, we are ranked number one in the world for, for T20 and, and 50 over cricket. Unfortunately, we, we didn't bring the Ashes home, but we have another shot at that in January. Um, and I think England p possibly were leading the way in terms of their f support for their women. Um, and they, they saw a, really, a real dominance over the last sort of five years or so. And um, it's been a bit of a build-up for us to, to get back to number one. Um, and I think now we are leading the way, certainly, with, with the support. I don't think um, you could look at the other nations, even England, and say that they're supported better than, than the Southern Stars. Um, it was interesting when we won the World Cup and we had a celebration dinner and Wally got up and, and um, congratulated us and, and gave us a great surprise that we would be receiving a $10,000 bonus. And I was sitting next to Michael Kasperowitz at the time and... I was like, oh, right, that, so obviously that's to split. Um, and uh, <laughs> he's like, no, no, it's, it's that's each. And he's like, how are you going to spend it? And uh, I just, that was just a really great step. That was before, um, before the new contracts came in. And, yeah, we're just feeling really positive about being involved in, in, um, in cricket at the moment. And I'm really excited to see where... So the younger players in the Southern Stars... Um, coming through who are 17 years old, uh, Holly Furling I'm, I'm talking about, you know, when she's, she's leaving school with $25,000 in, in her pocket, um, going into university and when she's my age, I don't know, she might be a full-time cricketer. And I think the numbers are nearly up to 200,000 around Australia women cricketers. Um, you're a big advocate for women having a, a competition in the Big Bash League. How close are we to that? Yeah, it's something I've, I've spoken to James about and, and I continue to ask the question about a women's BBL and, and it, it is in the pipeline and, and um, you know, I think it, it'll be sooner rather than later that we see a women's BBL and I certainly hope so. Uh, I just think it, it's sensible that um, we would leverage what's happening with the men's BBL and, and, and have women playing in the same uniforms, same sort of competition... Uh, a condensed competition that we may attract the the Dottons or the Greenways or the, the Catherine Brunts from all around the world to come and play in, in the Premier T20 competition around the world. So I think Australia can do that. And, um, yeah, I, let's hope it's next season. I don't know. James, how close is it? <laughs> <laughs> Just to put him on the spot, I'll ask another question. I'll ask one more question and then uh, open it obviously up to, to the floor. Um, the threat of the, of the new format of the game, which is not so much new anymore, but 2020 obviously designed to attract the younger market, families, um, for television audiences. How much is it impacting the game for the good and for the potentially negative, Rod? Well, you know, a wise man said to me once that... <clears throat> not that long ago, actually. <laughs> he said that uh, you shouldn't be allowed to play T20 cricket until you're 30. <laughs> and if you just stop and think about that... Uh, I don't think that's a bad solution. Um, it Maybe it should be the topping on the cake after your career, after you've fought your guts out for your country, after you've given everything to the real form of the game, then you get your rewards by playing the short form of the game. I'm not saying I agree with it necessarily, but I'm not saying I disagree with it. Mm. In fact, I'm sitting on the fence. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, your thoughts? That's how Rodney got the crack in his bum. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> we are streaming live. <laughs> Look, it's a, it's a heck of a challenge. The, the modern cricketer is challenged more than any other generation before with the, the different um, formats and the, the adaptability that's required to go across the formats. I think it'll be very hard for, for most cricketers to play all three formats. Mm. Um, I, I think that uh, story that Rod told about you know, not being able to play till late is not a bad thing. I think it's a real challenge for young cricketers trying to develop their game to be chopping and changing so much and, and playing so much 2020 cricket early on. 
Um, it's not a bad coaching tool in the sense that I think, you know, getting them out and playing some games rather than being in the nets all the time is, is not a bad thing. Uh, but it is a hell of a challenge to, uh, to go across the, the three formats, particularly for a, for a young cricketer, because the, uh, what it requires to be a good hitter is very different to being a good batter. And uh, I'm not sure many players are going to make that, uh, be able to make that assessment and, and be able to adapt to it. Right, we are coming up to uh, nearly 10.30. So a couple of questions from the floor. If you just raise your hand, uh, we'll come around with a microphone. If there's anyone who has a question. Can I can't really see. Anyone? Bueller, there's one. And if you could just uh, state your name and who the question is to. Thank you. Uh, g'day. Um, my name's Greta Bradman. And my question is to Mike. Um, in particular, obviously you've had a very successful career as a psychoanalyst for, is it psychoanalyst, is that right, for the last 30, 30 years? Um, obviously psychology and psychologists play quite a role in sport these days. Um, given that, what do you think um, of the role of psychologists in sport and do you think that it, that role is optimised as it is or how could it be improved to, I suppose, provide that... Um, psychological aspect to the game and improve that in, um, in say, Australia's success over coming years? Thank you. I, I, <clears throat> it's a very good question and actually I don't know the answer because um, the essence, of, uh, I think there are, it's very hard to be a good coach, it's very hard to be a good teacher, it's a very hard to be a good, a really good player. It's hard to do anything very well and good coaches are fantastic. You know, they, they can sense what somebody needs, they can bring somebody around, they can know when to confront them and when to give them their head, they can know when to keep quiet, you know, they can know all sorts of different things as well as the more purely technical aspects of the game. But bad coaches can do a lot of damage and, and so can bad or indifferent psychologists. I think that most things in life one gets through in the ordinary course of events, like family life or marriage or playing in a cricket team, without the benefit of a professional. That, that's what I tend to think. And you get advice from your coach, you get advice from your other players, you discuss the game, you learn from watching, you hope you le learn enough. I mean, I was saying earlier to somebody that actually it's shocking to me how little I learned you know, for early on and how long it took me to learn things and to listen to people. And maybe someone who was really shrewd, really helpful, whether it was a psychologist or a coach, could have helped me to do that. But the, the difficulty is there's, there's a risk of overkill. And, um, and I wouldn't like to think of too much more s professional psychological input, personally. 